Go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, let's look at verse, uh, maybe verse 22, 23. Let's see. Verse 23. Everybody there? Go, uh huh. Okay. Verse 23 says, And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. Ahithophel was David's counselor. He wound up being Absalom's counselor. And your Bible says that Ahithophel, the words that he spoke, was as he was the oracle of God. Ahithophel had such an anointing on him, such a move of God, that when the king needed to hear a word from God, Ahithophel was, Ahithophel was the one who came in with God's word, God's mind, and set the direction for the nation of Israel. You know, people who are, how can I say this? People who are in charge are important. But the one that's influencing the one that's in charge, sometimes even more important, amen. And Ahithophel was the one that was influencing David. His words were the words of God. Now that's in chapter 16. But if you go over one chapter, go over to chapter 17, and look again at verse 23, exactly one chapter over. And Ahithophel, the man who spoke like God, and Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed. He saddled his ass, arose, got him home to his house, to his city. Watch this. Put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Now, I was raised on the edge of the hood, and, and there's a saying I was raised up with that comes to mind right now when I read it. In one chapter, he was God's man and had such a move of God that he spoke as God. Then in the next chapter, he's hanging himself. Makes me want to go, do what? Do what? Say what? How come? How do you go from... Being God's oracle, when he was talking, it was like God was talking to you. Don't you know we need some people that when they talk to us, it's like God talking to us? Because God knows we got a bunch of people that try to talk to us and it ain't nowhere near God talking to us. How do you go from being God's spokesman to committing suicide? I'd say it's a... It's a pretty serious, it's a pretty serious thing. What, what occurred in Ahithophel's life? What changed? What affected him to the place that he got so angry? Let's be honest. He got so angry. He got so bitter on life that he killed himself. This man who was God's spokesman killed himself. Ahithophel's story is wrapped up in David's story. So I want to talk to you a little bit about David's story. And we might find the truth that will help us understand Ahithophel's story. David at first shows up, he was a shepherd. Then we see he's a giant killer. Then he's the king of Israel. Ahithophel had a, I mean, David had a counselor, and it was this man, Ahithophel. One day, David's at the peak of his success. And your Bible says it's a time when kings would go to war, but David stayed at home the rest. You don't need to be resting when it's time to pray and when it's time to read your Bible. You don't, I won't go ahead and shake that bush because I didn't get no amen. You, you don't need to be resting on Sunday morning when it's time to get in church. Can I shake it? And you don't need to be making excuses on Wednesday night why you can't get here at 7 o'clock when you got off work at 5. Okay, Hallelujah. It's going to be a long Sunday. <laughs> David's at his success. 
He's, he's, up, he, he's up on the rooftop when he should be fighting. Y'all heard that song, Up on the Rooftop? James Taylor, anyway. <laughs> David's up on the rooftop and he looks across the street. And there's Bathsheba bathing. Woo, she was a looker. And something got hold of David. And he called some of his men. He said, go over and tell Bathsheba to come see me. I want to see Bathsheba. You know the story Bathsheba comes in. David sleeps with her. This, I'm just going to be honest, has sex with her. Then the next morning, he sends her home. Ain't that just like a man? He got what he wanted, and he sent her home. But you know what? In just a little while, she sent word back to David. And she said, it's in your Bible, she said the words that strike fear into the heart of every young man. She said, I am with child. Probably shaking his head. His wife's not here. He can shake his head. <laughs> All you men know that those are words that get your attention. You in your 20s and your 30s, we're all adults here, and let your wife say, I skipped a month. Oh, God, you're going into a panic. <laughs> and now David had a problem. Because now Bathsheba's pregnant. And the problem is, she's married to Uriah. And Uriah is a soldier in David's army. And Uriah, at this point, had been out for close to three months fighting. That's why David could have his way with Bathsheba. Her husband had been gone for three months. So David comes up with a plot. He says, I got to do something. I can't let my sin be found out. I got to do something. You know, you don't have to watch soap operas to get all kind of drama. You can just read the Bible. There's some stuff in your Bible. I mean, some stuff. We're about to talk about some stuff. So here's what David says. He says, well, let's do this. He says, go out to the battlefield and get Uriah and tell him he's been out there fighting so long that I want him to come back in and rest a, a few days. And when he gets back, of course, he'll go into his wife. And then when he finds out she's pregnant, he'll think that, you know, the time's right and he's the one that impregnated her. Well, they bring Uriah home, and Uriah's a man of honor. And he says, how can I go into my wife when my brothers are out risking their lives? And so he don't go into his wife. Oh, man, David's still scheming. And he says, I got to do something. So he throws a big party. And he makes sure that Uriah gets skunky drunk. Y'all ever seen anybody that was skunky drunk? They stink up the whole room, right? And, 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 and he's thinking he's going to get drunk. He, won't, he can't help himself. He's been gone three months, man. He's going to go in to mama. Need I say any more? And he gets Uriah drunk, and he still won't go into his wife. David, David, it's good to see you. David says, okay, these serious times, i got to take a serious step. So he writes a letter to Joab, who was in charge of David's army, who, by the way, Joab was David's nephew. And he's going to pull his family in on his scheme now. And he writes a letter and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this brother, and I want you to put him out in the heat of the battle. And when the battle waxes hot, pull your men back and let him die. And when he dies, send me back word that he's dead. Boy, he had some nasty stuff up in him, didn't he? And, and here's, the, here's the, the bad part about it. He sent the letter. He, Donnie, he took the letter to kill Uriah. And he put it in Uriah's hand and said, Uriah, take this letter to Joab. I want you to know the devil is slick. And here goes Uriah with a letter to give to Joab, telling Joab to kill Uriah. Now, I've always questioned this. David had wives 
He had concubines. He had plenty of women in his life. He didn't need Bathsheba. But here's the truth of the matter. Sin is never satisfied. And if you start letting sin dictate to you, it'll take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. And you'll never get back to where you started from. So here goes Uriah with the letter. And of course, Uriah lost his life. And the word comes back to David. And now it seems like everything's fine. I will say it again. David, who the Bible says was a man after God's heart. Had some nasty stuff up in him. And you know what? Pretty much everybody in here at some time in your life, you've had some nasty stuff up in you. Uriah dies and David takes Bathsheba to be his wife. Now it seems that all is well. David's got this thing hid. He's got her up in his house. Ain't nobody going to know what went on. He's covered this thing. Of course, God always sees. But see, here's the problem. Always understand this. When you think you're sneaking, when you think you're getting by, there's always somebody somewhere that sees what you did. You might slip in her house and slip out of her house. And you think nobody knows because it's 2 o'clock in the morning. There's somebody down the street that's seen what you did. You may not see them, but they see you. And so talk started going around. He couldn't bring her up in his palace with guards and servants and people everywhere and somebody not talk. They knew she spent the night with him and it struck them kind of funny that her husband's dead and now he's married to her and Lord have mercy. In one month's time, she's pregnant. It never ceases to amaze me when somebody wants me to marry them, and I marry them, and in seven months to have a baby. So talk started going around to watch, and talk got up to Ahithophel, David's counselor, the man we started talking about first. Talk got up to Ahithophel. Ahithophel becomes angry. And embittered at David. He's mad. At the same time this is going on, Absalom, is the story losing y'all yet? Y'all follow me. If you, if, you, if you let your mind wander, you'll get lost. At the same time all this is going on with David and Bathsheba, Absalom, David's son, leads a rebellion. He's going to take the kingdom from David. Ahithophel had been David's personal friend. And counselor all through David's life. And for some unexplained reason, Ahithophel leaves David and goes with his son. And now, instead of being David's friend and being David's counselor, he's with Absalom and he's trying to kill David. How can a man who is the voice of God for David? Comes in and ministers to God, ministers to David as God, and now he's trying to kill him. Literally, trying to take horses and men and go kill him. Read the story. I don't have time to read it all today. It's a messed up story. It's a messed up story. And it's during all of this season that Ahithophel is so mad at David and he's turned on David. That he kills himself. How did he lose his walk with God? And why is he so mad? And why is he so bitter? Can I unfold that story for you? There's always a story in the story. 
And when somebody reacts one way and you're wondering what the heck's wrong with them, they react in that way because of something over here to happen. Now watch, oh, watch this. Watch this. 2 Samuel, I'm, I'm going to unfold this for you. 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 3. Go back to where, when David sent for Bathsheba. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba? The daughter of Eliam. Notice that. She's the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She's the daughter of Eliam. Well, go over to chapter 23. Go over to chapter 23. And look at verse 34. He's numbering, David's numbering the people, which he shouldn't do. And it says, If Lelep, the son of Hashbeah, the son of Mashatite, watch now, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel. Whoa, 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 what we just said. Bathsheba, her daddy was Eliam. And Eliam's daddy was Ahithophel. So Bathsheba was Ahithophel's granddaughter. Oh, now this thing's starting to come together. Ahithophel has bitterness toward David. If you haven't figured out yet today, I'm preaching on bitterness. Last week I preached on uh, having an offense. We're going to take it into bitterness today. Ahithophel is mad at David because David had sex with his married granddaughter and then killed her husband. And now Ahithophel is caught up in bitterness. Everybody say bitterness. Bitterness. You got to be careful when somebody does something to your family that you don't let it mess you up the rest of your life. Now watch this. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Is everybody okay? I'm going somewhere. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. It says this. Paul says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Well, um, there goes that once saved, always saved stuff. I'm, oh, I'm by myself up here. If you think you can live like hell and still go to heaven, I, surprise. He said, be careful lest you fail of the grace of God. Watch this. Lest any, here it is, root of bitterness... Springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. A root of bitterness can defile you. Ahithophel took his life. Let me tell you what the word bitterness means. One of the two definitions. One, one definition of the word bitterness is poison. If you're holding grudges against people, you're drinking poison. Let me say that again. If you're holding unforgiveness and grudges, you're drinking poison. Because, see, look, an offense will cause you to hold unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will turn into bitterness. Then bitterness will defile you. Here, here's, here's the second meaning of the word bitterness. Bitterness means simply this. Smoldering resentment. Think about that. Smoldering resentment. I think about a pile of leaves out in the yard. I got a bunch of oak trees in my front yard, and I rake them up and burn them leaves. I can get a big old pile of leaves, and it, that thing will smolder a day or two. It just, and every once in a while, the wind will blow, and it'll, it'll blaze up. Then it'll go back down, and I see a hot spot here and there. And it's just, and, and, and while it's smoldering, it stinks up the whole neighborhood. I love it when I've got five piles of leaves, smoke coming them off of them, and the wind's blowing it right into my neighbor's front yard. <laughs> and that's a picture, listen, that's a picture when somebody does something to you, and you let bitterness get in you, you walking around with that thing. Just... And every time... Something blows just right, boy. 
that resentment just comes on back up. I'm going to get some of y'all free today. So Ahithophel was bitter. He was smoldering with resentment. And he couldn't get over it. David did something to his granddaughter. And he couldn't get over it. And he couldn't let it go. He just couldn't let it go. And he found that it changed his whole life because he had bitterness instead of staying with David, who he knew because he had a move of God. And he knew that God had anointed David. And he knew that Absalom was wrong. But he couldn't help because he was so full of bitterness to go get off in that wrong. Bitterness will make you change things in your life that you'd never do. He's, he's bitter. And watch this. He lost his life because he let bitterness and unforgiveness get a hold of him. I'd never do that. You got bitterness at somebody and you pull up to the bylaw. You go into the grocery store and you see them walking in the door and you go over to Ingalls because you don't want to bump into them in the bylaw. You want to go to a ball game and you think they're going to be there and you won't even go to the ball game because you don't want to bump into them. You pass them in the church hallway and you look like you're looking somewhere else because you don't want to make eye contact with them. You're losing your life. Well, I hit the field had bitterness. You're bitter because of what they did to you. I'm delivering some of y'all this morning. Listen to what I'm saying. And like a movie in your head, you play it over and over and over, and you can't go on with your life because you're stuck right there at the place of the offense. You can't get past what they did for you, what they did to you. Am I preaching to anybody in here? Let me give you right quick, I won't preach much longer, but let me give you four keys that I think will get you over bitterness. I think if Ahithophel could have realized this, he would have kept the move of God, he would have stayed in God's will, he wouldn't have went with Absalom, and he wouldn't have killed himself. Here's four keys. They're simple. This is not deep theological stuff. I'm just kind of talking to you today where we live. Does everybody say where we live? Here's the first thing that, I, that I, I want you to understand about if bitterness is trying to get on you. Listen, this is, real, this is real deep. Are you ready? Realize that they are not worth you losing out with God. Amen. We say it again. They are not worth you losing out with God. If you let bitterness get in your life, it will affect your relationship with God every time. You can't have an anointing on your life and be hating somebody at the same time. Amen. Listen, I got a revelation for you. Are you are, listen to this. Seeking to hurt those that hurt you doesn't hurt them. It only hurts you. Seeking to hurt somebody that hurts you does not hurt them. It only hurts you. Why are you thinking about getting back at them? You suck in your teeth every time you think about them. You can't stand them if somebody mentions their name, something in you blows up. Let me tell you something. You're the only one with the drama. They done moved on. They don't, they don't even remember what they did to you. It's been 10 years, and you've been pouting like a big old baby and bitter for 10 years. You mad, and they down at the party happy. You might as well let it go. No matter what they did, no matter how they try, if you hold bitterness, they can never do enough for you to forgive them. Oh, I'm talking now. I'm about to get into some of his business. If, if, if you hold bitterness, what, what can they do if you're not willing to forgive them? 
There's been marriages split up. And children grow up without both their parents in the house because somebody wouldn't forgive when somebody sinned. Now, I ain't talking about living in crazy stuff now. I'm talking about, I'm talking about just harboring unforgiveness. Watch this. David, you know the story? Nathan, the prophet came in to David. Told him a story about the sheep. And David said, who is this man? The prophet said, you're the man. And David repented. While Ohithophel was holding a grudge and bitterness at David, before Ohithophel left David and went to Absalom, David repented. Now what I want to read, David wrote this psalm after Nathan came into him. This is Psalm 51. I want you to listen to what David said. Have mercy on me, God, according to your loving kindness, according to the tender multitude of your mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me. Watch now. I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. And against thee and thee only have I sinned. If they come up to you and they said, look, I'm sorry. I was having a bad day. I shouldn't have had that attitude. I wish I hadn't have done that. And you still going to hold bitterness? Aren't you a spiritual giant? Am I running anybody off wrong? Not yet. Uh. No, if you're going to hold bitterness, I'm going to say it again. You're going to have it the rest of your life. No matter what they do, you're going to hold it. But I'm going to tell you something. You know you saved. You know you're born again when people that don't like you, people that hate on you, people that work against you, people that try to cause you pain, and you just look at them and in your heart, you know you've forgiven them and you've let it go. You know you saved. No, you got the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you. When those same people that tried to hurt you, they tried to destroy you, they're continually trying to damage your reputation, they're trying to get you, get you, get you, and still the Holy Ghost in you says, let it go. Just love on them. Just pray for them. Just help them. Hey, I come by to tell you, no matter what kind of root of bitterness the devil tries to put in your life, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can let it go. You don't have to let it ruin your life whatever they did it ain't worth you going to hell over you 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 gonna live a life like an old prune sucked up sour face wrinkled up list first thing is realize they not worth worth you losing God over Here's the second thing about bitterness. I'll be through in just a minute. Here's the second thing about bitterness. When somebody does something to you, listen careful. Realize you're not their judge. I thought I'd get more amens than that. You're not their judge. I read it to you just in Psalms 50, 51. David said, against thee and against thee only have I sinned. You might have felt the effect of their sin But let's put this thing in perspective. Their sin was against God. You're not their judge. They didn't really sin against you. You got hit with it, but they didn't sin against you. And you don't have a heaven or a hell to put them in. That ain't your place. God said in Romans chapter 12, He said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'm helping you if you got bitterness in your life right now. If you'll listen to what I'm saying, this will help you get rid of that bitterness. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Listen, God will get them. You don't have to. God saw it when it happened. And you trying to get back on them, you talking nasty about them, you gossiping about them, you running them down, you judge everything they do, and you just trying your best to get them, and God's waiting for you to let go so He can get them. And why are you trying to give them vengeance? Your little limited way. God might just say, okay, you're going to handle this? You're going to keep this in your hand? Then I'll just pull back and let you have it. I can promise you, you had rather God deal with them 
then you deal with them. Because when God gets somebody, God gets them good. God gets somebody so bad that wrongs you that you'll start praying, Lord, it's enough. Leave them alone. I've seen that happen in my life. People do stuff, and a year or so later, I'm saying, Lord, have mercy on them. They messed up. Leave them. You got to get to the place, church, to where you can say, yeah, you, you, you done me wrong. You done me bad wrong. But I am going to take my hands off of this. Listen, tell yourself, I'm not going to do you like you did me. Oh, this separates the men from the boys right here. I'm not going to do you like you did me. Watch. Matthew chapter 5. The whole time you judging them, and you mad at what they did, and you trying to do the same thing back to them, are you any different from them? What you hating on in them, you doing yourself. Boy, them kind of people make me mad. <laughs> it's hard to stay safe, isn't it? I was watching a preacher this week, and he was talking about something else. And he said, oh, Lord, help me. I feel a cussing spirit coming on me. I'm so mad. <laughs> I ain't wanting to cuss about it, but I'm going to tell you something. It's, it's loathsome. It's really. you mad at them, and you're the same way. Matthew chapter... I didn't think y'all be amen to me much. Matthew chapter 5. Watch this. Matthew chapter... Um, where am I at? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. Watch this. But I say unto you... Now, this is Jesus talking. Let's slow down right here. Because this is where we live. And if you got bitterness, you, this will get you free. See, I'm, I'm just trying to pastor you today. I'm trying to be your friend. I'm trying to help you. This will get you free right here if you got bitterness. Jesus said, but I say unto you, get even with your enemies. Jesus said, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Oh, and this is really the hard one right here. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I'm going to tell you, that's a hard one for me. Because you get spiteful on me, there's something in me I want to spite back. And you nasty thing, look at your neighbor and say, yeah, you nasty too. You do the same thing. Do it. Yeah. I want to spite, I want to get, I'm, I'm confessing. First, realize they're not worth you losing that with God over. Second, realize you ain't their judge. All right, all right here we go. Now I'm really going to hit home. Third, while you're so consumed with their sin, realize you ain't sinless. Oh, Jesus, I thought I would get a better response than that. Say it again. Realize that you ain't sinless. And why are you a quick to hate on the wrong that they did to you, may I remind you, they some people that you've done wrong. You have hurt some people. You have damaged some people. And if you want people to forgive you, you got to be willing to forgive people. Do it again. Look at your neighbor again and say, I know there's some nasty up in you. I know you guys. I done seen you show an attitude. I know there's some nasty. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14 and 15. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Verse, uh, verse, 15 say, verse 14 says, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, Neither will their father, your father, forgive you. 
How are you going to have a relationship with God and walk in unforgiveness? I mean, this, this is not no super spiritual thing. Ahithophel did not have to die. All he had to do was say to his granddaughter, Honey, I'm sorry. I pray for you. We're going to give this to God. We're going to move on. We're not going to let this one incident dictate the rest of our lives. Hey, some of y'all are here right now today, you've let one incident, it might have been 10 years ago, but you've let it dictate your whole life. So, realize they ain't worth losing out over. Realize you're not their judge. Realize you're not sinless. Here's one of the last things I want to say to you. Stop for just a minute and realize that the pain that they put you through has helped promote you. Oh, I thought somebody would do the huckabuck right there. I said, realize that the pain that they put you through has helped promote you. Instead of being so bitter, you just need to look at them one day and go, you know what? If you hadn't have done to me what you did, I wouldn't be where I am. Oh, you meant to hurt me, but you helped push me forward because when you came all against me, guess what I did? I dropped down on my knees and I started praying and I actually got my Bible and I started reading it and I started looking at myself and I wanted to see if there was something wrong in me. I thank you for that pain because that pain slung me right into my purpose. You know, sometimes you just got to get this spirit. I know you left me, and it hurt you. Hurt me when you left me. You dope taking alcoholic abusing thing. But because you left me, guess what? I found the spouse that God wanted me to have, and now I got a wonderful family. You you left me, but I got the family of my dreams. Hey, you might have fired me on that last job. You might have caused me to lose that last job. But I want to thank God now. I wouldn't own this business and be prospering like I'm prospering if I didn't have to go look for a job somewhere. You, hey, you might have called me, you might have run me off from my last church. They might have offended you and you had to leave. It might have been a mess and you thought, I can't stay here. Don't be bitter at them. Instead say, thank you, because I landed it set free. Hey, I just let go and let God, and God swept me into my destiny. That's the attitude you got to have. I'm going to close. I think about old Joseph. Boy, if anybody could get bitter, Joseph could have got bitter. Sold into slavery, lied on by Potiphar's wife. All of that. He's in prison. I think it's close to 13 years. He's in prison. He kept a move of God. And when his brothers came, and they freaked out when they realized who, who he was, you know what he said? Sister Golden, he said, I'm in the place of God. All that pain that you gave me put me where I'm supposed to be. Oh, if we could understand that instead of letting it eat us up. All that pain brought the purpose of God in my life. You could actually get to the place to where you thank God for pain. Jesus said there in Luke chapter 17, he said, it's, it's impossible that offenses will come. But woe unto him by who they come. Because an offense will cause bitterness. And then he went right into that thing about, if you'll say to this sycamine tree, be plucked up by the roots, that it'll be plucked up. Why did he talk about, all of a sudden, he brings up a sycamine tree. Understand something about a sycamine tree. Look just like a mulberry tree. Sycamine tree had a, a fig on it, and the mulberry tree had a fig on it. It looked the same. People with money and influence ate the figs off the mulberry tree because it was sweet. People who didn't have much had to eat the figs off the sycamine tree because the fig on the sycamine tree was so bitter. And here's how you had to eat the fig off the sycamine tree, that bitter fruit. You couldn't eat the whole thing at once. 
It was so bitter, it, it just tear you up. You couldn't eat the whole thing at once. So they kept that thing in their pocket, and they'd pull it out, and they'd chew a little bit of it until they got all the bitterness they could get in them. When it was full of bitterness, they'd put it back in their pocket. A little while later, they'd pull it out, and they'd chew on it and put it back in their pocket. And every time that person's name comes up, you pull out your fig and you chew on it. And you put it back in your pocket. Then you see them next week and you pull out that fig and you chew on it. And here's the thing. The Jews' favorite wood to make a casket out of was the wood from a sycamore tree. Jesus was saying, if you eat this bitter fruit in your life, it's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. There comes a time in everybody's life where you have to say, God, help me. This is more than I can handle. Have you ever prayed this way? I've prayed this way. Lord, You know my heart. I've tried to forgive it. But it hurt me so deep that I need help. But here's what I found out. If we cast our care on Him, He'll take them every time. He'll take them every time. I talked last week on offense. I talked this week on bitterness and what it did in Ahithophel's life. Because I know that those are two of the easiest things for the devil to trip us up with. And I don't want to see nobody walking around with an offense and a root of bitterness in them. Let me tell you, get rid of it. Walk free from it. It's not worth you living in it. I don't care what they did. When something bad happens, a lot of times I look at my wife and I'll say, there's one thing I know. I don't know how this is going to work out right here today, but there's one thing I know. 100 years from now, it won't make any difference. And that's the attitude you got to take sometimes. Hey, it might be bad today, but in, in light of eternity, this ain't going to make no difference. I'm still going to heaven. My name's still written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hi, my name is Yolanda, and I'm a volunteer here at Set Free. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch the sermon video. We want to know what special and exciting things that God is doing in your life. If there's anything we can do to serve you, be in prayer about, or celebrate with you, contact us at 864-269-3620 or at hello at setfreecf.com. It is because of your generosity that we're able to expand our reach for the kingdom. So if you're blessed by this ministry and would like to donate or learn more, feel free to visit us at setfreecf.com. We pray that you have a blessed week.